You know, we're really excited to have a number of students, a number of teachers and educational leaders with us today. You know, in this particular part of the panel, we really want to focus on our education phase. You know, we've talked a little bit about earlier about inspiration and what does it take to really get students inspired about doing this work. But what you've seen out in the foyer with the students out there, it took a lot of support, it took a community, it took a lot of practice on becoming an inventor even at this early age. So, you know, when I talk about inventors, one of the first things that comes to my mind is Nate Ball. I don't know if Nate's in the audience with us to do. He's a LMIT student prize winner, and I've had the opportunity to hear Nate Ball speak a number of times about kind of his pathway to becoming an inventor and the learning process that it took to really get to the point where he is. You know, inventors are, they're different. They really need a creative tool of sweets uh, to get them where they are. You know, part of the inventive process, or even inventors, is they see the world in a very different way. They see problems around us every day. So providing you know, young inventors with the ability to understand the problems of the wor world, understanding empathy on how to accomplish that, to really think critically, those are some of the key components of the inventor's education pathway. But they also need critical tools, which we call our inventor's toolkit. They have to have the knowledge and the skill areas to really take their ideas from really an idea to an actual product, an invention. So in that, they need to learn about you know, how do they fabricate, how do they prototype their, they need a strong base of knowledge around entrepreneurship. You know, inventions are only inventions unless they actually hit the, the market and really truly impact the lives of other people. You know, in Jerome Lemelson's vision, he really felt that educational programs were really important to kind of changing the trajectory that we've seen out in the foyer for students who may not have ever thought they'd become an inventor, but today you're seeing these young inventors in actions and will take and continue with their education process through higher education. So I'm excited to be joined here by this uh, lovely panel of, uh, like I said, educational leaders and students and teachers. And there's not a lot of folks, we couldn't bring everyone up on the stage, but I'd love to just give a round of applause to our educators who are out in the audience one more time. Raise your hand if you're an educator. So I'd like to just begin with introductions for those folks who are on the stage here. We have Josh Schuler, who is our Executive Director of the Lemelson MIT program. Good morning. We have <laughs> Shelly Myrdrin, who is a master teacher in Invent Team and teacher at Cesar Chavez High School in Arizona. We have Abby Arona, who is a student as well. She's a senior here at Cesar Chavez High School and Invent Team's participant. And from our Global Minimum Project, we have Eli Suzuki, Chief Operating Officer for the Global Minimum Project. Also, we refer to it as G-Men, if you hear me going back and forth. Welcome. <laughs> and we have Rose Waigajo, as principal from the Mary Leakey Girls High School in Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> and we have Emma Karanja, who you just heard, a wonderful presentation, also a participant of the G-Men Project and a junior at Mary Leakey's Girls High School in Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> So Josh, I want to just jump in right away. I'm going to begin sure. with you. I mean, talking about the LMIT program, it's been around for quite some time. Sure. Started off with the prize winners. It's moved on to collegiate prize winners. You got it. So but you're, you're really trying to engage even earlier in the project. So can you tell us a little bit, you know, Absolutely. How, how do you get in that point? All right. Happy to do it. Thanks so much, David. Uh, so the Lemelson MIT pro, uh, program is both about awards and invention education. The awards program, which Michael Seema spoke about, our half million dollar prize and our student prize competition, which is now a national competition. They've been going on since we started and we have, as they've been recognized already, a number of student prize winners, a number of prize winners, a number of also award for global innovation, sustainability and lifetime achievement winners in the audience, so that's great. So that's one side of what we do. The other side is invention education, okay? That's providing tools, resources, opportunities to not just students but also their educators to invent. Um, and it's, it's from the basic and beginning desire of, of Jerry and Dolly to inspire the next generation. And Invent Teams, which is, you know, we like to call it our, our Cadillac uh, program, uh, actually had a precursor, which was called the Invention Apprentice Program. And that was a opportunity over the summer for an individual high school student to go and work alongside an inventor. It's an amazing opportunity. And I think we have, if they're not here already, at least two or three alumni from our Invention Apprenticeship Program. And like programs do, we wanted to have more impact. How do you get more impact? You need to involve more students. So we developed Invent Teams and launched it in 2002 with three schools in New England. Uh, and it's grown significantly since then. Now we average about 15 schools each year nationwide. And Invent Teams provides an opportunity for high school students, educators, and mentors to do 
an invention to identify, for the students to identify, a problem that they want to address with a technology-based invention. Now, I was very specific there. It's the students who have to identify because that takes, you know, it, it's, a, it's hard, as we've heard. You need to have resilience. And also, it's a long project. It's about seven and a half months long. It's a long project for high school students and college students to work on. So if it's something they want to work on, that's even better. Um, we've probably, we're, we're close to getting our 200th Invent Team um, this coming year. We're very excited about that. I'd say over 2,500 students, well over 2,500 students have been touched in some way by the program. And we're really proud of the impact so far. Um, we have a Invent Team's alumni survey, which we've been conducting. We have the preliminary results, which you guys will hear about soon. Um, but we're really excited because they consider themselves inventors. Over 30% of the alumni who responded to that survey said they were inventors. 35%, I think, in fact. Um, they're entering the STEM workforce. They're perceiving themselves as leaders, and they're doing entrepreneurial things. They're starting companies. Um, and you know, we've been hearing about impact inventing. The alumni and inventing participants want to do inventions, want to work on problems that matter. They want to do impact inventing. Um, the other thing we're proud of is our participation at venues like this, but also venues at, you know, down the street at 1200 uh, Pennsylvania Avenue where we've been part of the White House. I got the address right, didn't I? 16. 16. <laughs> I was wondering why I didn't get a reaction. <laughs> 1600 Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, Abby didn't, didn't mention two things, which I'm going to, maybe this is a spoiler alert, but we've had, you know, of the five past White House science fairs, Invent Teams has been the most represented national program. Uh, and I think that's pretty significant. Cesar Chavez was one, one of the schools there our first year. And I was just talking with Shelley backstage, and, and you heard from Abby about, you know, there have been some prototype changes. Uh, they, were, they were instructed very firmly not to allow the president to sit in the chair because of the sharp edges. Um, <laughs> but, and, and lastly, um, over the course of, of Invent Teams, we've had three, uh, three teams uh, be awarded patents. Now, that's a huge achievement. It's not the overall goal. The overall goal is to have the students learn the process and the educators learn the process and do it again and again. So that's really, I think, also pretty important, the three patents. So that's yeah. Invent Teams. I can talk more if you want, but I'm probably. <laughs> I'd love to take a minute because, I mean, there's a lot of schools out there who are considered under-resourced and often don't get these great opportunities. And I've seen a lot of in my work where, where there's still a critical gap in meeting that need for under-resourced communities. But, I mean, an LMS MIT program started a new program to begin to address that. Yes, we did. Just, you can tell us about it. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, one of the things we realized was that not only were low-resource schools having a you know, survey, we, you know, we surveyed the participants and see how they do on the experience, and we wanted to provide uh, an opportunity for students and, and educators in these low resource settings, so we launched Junior Varsity Invent Teams in 2014. And what Junior Varsity is about is a scaffolded learning experience where students and their educators go through units, and they're very hands-on, and to develop hands-on and minds-on skills, to use tools. The way I like to talk about it is an early on-ramp to invention ed or even invent teams. Mm -hmm. The goal there is not for them to do, you know, graduate to invent teams, although that's nice, but to graduate and have the confidence to do other things, other hands-on STEM-related fields and invention. Um, we're really happy to be partnering with Stanley Black & Decker on that, and they, they support us by providing tools um, to each of the school sites. Uh, this past year, we had 26 sites uh, in Massachusetts, Texas, and uh, Oregon. Next year, we'll have up to uh, 35 sites when we add California in. And these are groups of about 20 students and an educator who work um, on these specific units like shoe soles and hydroponics and electronic textiles. And they learn these skills that they can apply later on. And that's, that's been a great opportunity and learning experience. And the thing that we've learned is it's not just low resource schools that can use these opportunities, but it's all schools and all students. So it's a nice thing to be able to leverage it. No, it's wonderful to be able to access and provide this opportunity to all students across both the U.S. and even in our international programs. Absolutely. You know, it's great to have us joined by, like I said, mentioned earlier, some teachers are in the audience, and then we also have, uh, you know, uh, some educators here on the stage today. And, you know, when my, during my work at during the Mesa program, it was really clear to me, and, you know, even early on in my education career, that teachers really are the front line of defense in terms of educating our youth and really inspiring them and educating them into the role. And I often know they're not as celebrated or provided the resources that they actually need. You know, I'm, you know, I'm really excited to have Shelly. You know, I've had a lot of great conversations with Shelly. She's a you know, master teacher. So in my mind, a master teacher is kind of, has the equivalent of a black belt. 
They've gone or gone a significant amount of training. Um, she now trains other teachers on how to begin to do this practice. You know, I know, that, uh, Shelley, there's a lot of teachers who would feel like they can never be where you are today. They can never teach this type of education. You know, what, tell us a little about your story and how you've come to becoming the master teacher and getting your black belt. Um, I don't know that it's anything about me particularly, but I pay, I pay attention to other people and what I've been taught, and I'm very much formed by my experiences. So I want to kind of share with you some of the stories that I've had throughout my career that have brought me to this point. Um, because it's just daunting to me at how, or impressive to me at how my whole life has kind of culminated to this moment. Um, when I first arrived in South Phoenix as a teacher, which teaching was the last profession I wanted to go into, um, but when I got to college and wanted to bring passion to my work, it was, it was one of the only fields that you could do that with, and you can dream, and you can inspire people, and you can really make a difference. So that's why I chose this profession. Um, when, but when I arrived in South Phoenix, there was old equipment. The, the, the previous physics instructors didn't do labs, and I didn't know how to teach without giving, putting something in the kids' hands so that they could see how things worked. Um, so I pulled in, pulled in some experts from our local community, and they took one look at my equipment that was so old that they didn't really even know how it worked. I mean, it was older than I am. Um, and then they looked at my students and said, well, these kids don't need it anyway. At which I said, goodbye, thank you very much for coming. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I was appalled at that attitude because if I have students, they need to learn. And um, so when I was a kid, I used to take things apart a lot. My first car was a piece of junk that never ran. And my, my dad picked it out, so he faithfully helped me fix it every, when it broke down. We'd stay up till two or three in the morning sometimes fixing this car and making it work. Um, second gear didn't work when we put a new transmission in it. And he's like, well, does first gear work? I'm like, yeah. He said, does third gear work? I said, yeah. He said, well, skip second. <laughs> I was like, Dad, I don't think that's always supposed to work. But it, but it did work. And he's a really, um, he could always fix things. And I was usually taking these apart, so I gave him cause to fix things. Um, and my mom was fearless, and she would, and when I said I wanted to clean the toaster, I meant clean everything out of the inside of the toaster. Um, and then my dad had to fix the toaster. <laughs> um, so when, the, when these people left my school and I was left with this equipment that was old, I pulled out the old manuals and dusted them off and figured out what they were supposed to do. And my students and I, uh, at lunchtime, would take these things apart and try to fix them and try to get them working. And I was convinced that I couldn't do any of that. And Ann Beiser, one of my, one, an older mentor teacher for me, said, you'll get it, Shelley. Just keep working on it. You'll get it. You'll get it. And she gave me the encouragement and the courage that I needed to keep trying and keep doing things. Um, I applied to, I, we needed something that would work. So I applied to the, to the district for, for us to be able to build a car, which they promptly said no. Um, and then about a month later, the electric car program started, which flourished in the Southwest in the early 90s, where um, students were given a motor and a controller and went and found a car that they could convert from gas to electric, so we did that. And I learned a lot about that. Um, and uh, a local auto shop called us up and said, hey, do you want to work here? And I was like, no, we're fine here at our school, in the parking lot. Um, and he encouraged me, he kept calling me to, to come work at his shop, and he ended up, we ended up working there. And it was the community of South Phoenix then that embraced us and helped me and my students carry that forward. Um, it was really cool when um, Don Pedoni was having trouble understanding pressure, and we were working on the brakes that day, and to be able to show her the brake pedal and then the little tiny tube that goes to actually the, where, where it actuates the brakes. And she, then she was like, oh, I get it now. And that was awesome. Um, so I moved from electric cars and working on that, and having, every time I had to bring a chaperone, I'd, I'd have a, a male chaperone go with me to competitions, and they don't, people would always go talk to him instead of me, um, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, and they, they kind of bothered me. They, they with, a, with a baseball cap on, I looked like a 12-year-old little boy, um, which was challenging to, to have people 
understand that I kind of knew what I was doing. Um, and at, at one point, I was teaching a bunch of different preps, and I was explaining to a, a, a teacher that I was having trouble uh, planning and seeing through all the curriculum. And he stopped me and said, no, you have to. You have to. It's, it's important. You have to teach all this stuff. And if you have trouble, you've got resources, and you need to use them. Um, so I moved from them. So we raced electric cars, and it was just fantastic. It was so exciting. We traveled all over the country. We ended up winning the Tour de Sol at one point. Um, and then moved to robots and did all that. But I really wanted to, the students to do something that was useful and purposeful, but couldn't imagine in, in our community that we could, that we could do that. I'm, I'm not, I, I imagine you had to have something really, really special to be an inventor. And when I got involved with the Lemelson MIT program, which I'm so grateful for, because it changed my paradigm. It totally, with 20 years of, of teaching experience, it changed my paradigm to understand that kids can do this. And armed with imagination and learning some craft, being able to work tools and knowing what channel lock pliers are. Um, you know, you can, if you, if you learn all those things, there's so much to learn. And the science and the math, you can pull in together. And, and inspire kids to, to really um, take on these challenges. So when we had this opportunity, um, it was just, it was amazing. Uh, to, and, we, and our invention year was the President Obama's Educate to Innovate um, kickoff speech in the fall. And we, um, we watched that with just dreams and hearts ablaze. Um, so I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And since then, we've developed, I went to my principal and said, can we do this full time? So I was, um, we found another teacher to teach physics. And I'm teaching full time STEM and inventing. And, and it's, it's amazing. And the kids are, are just, they're phenomenal. I mean, it's amazing that you know, your process began with inventive thinking even instilled at you at a much younger age, and you've taken that to create a new community. And, you know, I know it really is a community. It was what we were, As we were prepping for this, you know, this call, next thing you know, I'm with Shelly and Abby, and it was the entire class. It was a learning opportunity for the <laughs> entire class to learn about this. I mean, you've created a really big community in a school that often sometimes where folks say it's an under-resourced community where you're teaching that this you know, this can take hold, you know. How did you develop that community and passion around inventing? Um, um, a few years ago, I was asked to teach ESL, which is um, students that, for which English is a second language or third or fourth language. Um, and we have a high stakes state test at the end of high school. And I said, well, okay, what's the plan for these kids? And I wanted to, you know, I knew that we'd need extra resources behind these kids. And so I went down to the office and I'm asking around and they said, well, these kids aren't going to pass the test, just don't worry about it. And I said, what? That, I was appalled. So I went back to my classroom and encountered these students who were really sharp. If we could keep them away from the Main Street kids, they could go really far. Uh, <laughs> because if they encountered the regular kids, sometimes they'd, they'd, they'd get lazy and, you know. Um, but they were fantastic. The only thing they didn't have was the English language, which for them was pretty, like, that's pretty simple, teach them English, like, hello. Um, so I ended up having uh, a few core kids that year, Hector and Fabiola and Christian, and they were just amazing kids. So I had them as freshmen, and then I tracked them. I kept track of them. And when they got to be seniors, I said, you guys need to take physics. So I offered the only ESL physics class in the district. Um, and Hector went from, he took intro to algebra the first year, which is like a before algebra class. And then his counselor messed up and gave it to him again as a sophomore. He ended up having calculus his senior year and graduating 12th in the senior class. Didn't speak English as a freshman. Fantastic. Full, and he earned a full um, scholarship, had um, an A average at ASU School of Electrical Engineering, um, just fantastic. And Fabiola now works in 
California for Lowe's in the distribution center. Um, and they just had aspirations and dreams and wanted to um, fulfill them. It, it took Christian like three or four trips. I had to take, I kept taking him to, to, to the university because I knew he had to go. He was so bright. Um, but his family was living in Mexico. He was living up here. He was trying to make money for the family. And I was like, man, you gotta go to college, you gotta go. And he went and he's, a couple summers ago, he, he uh, messaged me that he was in Costa Rica taking a biology class. He said, I'm great to So they get one shot. Yeah. The people, who, you know, it, they don't, their families don't have the resources for them to get another try. If they don't make it on a scholarship from, from high school, the odds of them going is really slim. 80% of our students drop out of university and college. So, um, so it's really, really important that they get these chances. Yeah. And learn resiliency and learn persistence and don't take no for an answer. Yeah, and I think we get to talk to Abby, I think, who has this persistence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Abby, I mean, you're a student event team, and it's amazing to have Shelly as a mentor. As I say even mentor, it's not just a teacher, it really is a mentor, is someone inspired. I mean, her li eyes light up when she talks about students. I mean, it was great to hear your, uh, your, you know, your invention and, and the team that you were working with. Of, you know, creating, uh, creating an invention to support someone who's medically fragile. You know, did you ever think that you could be an inventor? Did you ever have any thoughts kind of during the process? Well, I didn't really see myself as an inventor because well, I didn't think we'd be able to do it because my family is like, I didn't think I was going to be able to do anything for it. Because, yeah, I went to Chavez. It's not that great, I guess. <laughs> so, when, well, I, I wasn't planning to be in um, her first year class in robotics. I was planning to do something else, but they didn't have any other classes open. <laughs> so I took it anyways. And I like being in there. I met a lot of people in there that they're still with me now. Um, so I stayed in there and I started building robots in FTC. And I like doing that. And then last year, we did FTC, and we would just see like the physical therapy chair just sitting there, mm -hmm. and it looked okay, I guess. <laughs> so Ms. Myron said, we started Epics, and she asked students if they wanted to do invent teams and finish the chair. So it was only me and a couple of other students that actually took it up. So we did that because, well, I felt that it would help somebody who really needed it because let's make somebody else's world a little better, right? So yeah, and then I continued and I see that I can still, I can still do more. I can change somebody else's world. Yeah, and there's not, you know, we talk about this work and there's not a lot of ladies, you know, you're one of the only women on your team. You know, is that what drew you to the project? Is that, you know, that you're able to help other folks? What drew you to it? Um, that I was able to help other people. Like, we usually see them walking on campus because they like to take them out. So we just see them and they look so happy. But when we speak to the caregivers, it's, they told us how physical therapists only came like once, only came once a week. So they really didn't get the exercise that they needed. So I wanted to help them because, well, they don't look like they've done anything bad, right? Because they're always happy. So let's give them something in return. So what's next for you? Obviously, you're inspired about this work. You have a great mentor who's helping you. So what's next for you? You're a senior, you're graduating. Well, I'm planning to go to, to ASU and continue doing engineering. 
and I want to, I'm a major, I'm a major in engineering and I'm going to become a biomedical engineer. And I wanted to create limbs, but for like war veterans. So that's what I'm planning to do. That's amazing. Thank you. I'd love to turn to, you know, we have a little representation of our U.S. programs, and uh, in the Lumbleson Foundation, we really are impacting our education throughout the U.S. So I'd like to turn to uh, Ellie Suzuki. I mean, you have a program called Global Minimum, which you'll hear me refer to as GMIN. Uh, you know, it's working in Sierra Leone, South Africa, and recently expanded into the Kenya. You know, this invention education isn't usually the norm, even in the U.S., but it's definitely not the norm in kind of international environments. Uh, can you tell us about what uh, Global Minimum is doing? What kind of programs are you offering? And you know, what impact are you seeing with kids? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, at Global Minimum, we offer kind of a range of invention education program that really inspires the next generation of inventors in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, one of our flagship program is Innovation Challenge. Um, just recently, we, um, we had our fourth fourth year of Innovation Challenge in Sierra Leone, we went across um, 150 schools across the country in Sierra Leone, uh, where we saw um, about 750 students participating and proposing um, projects, invention projects, that, um, that solves community development challenge uh, that they're observing in their communities. And out of which about 30 to 40 students are working over the next um, three months or so, developing the first stage prototypes um, of um, their, and turning their ideas into, um, into an actual uh, solution. We, at Global Minimum, we provide um, supply budget or prototyping grant. We provide mentorship. We provide um, a safe space and tools to enable um, young uh, people between the age of 13 and 18, primarily secondary school students, to really uh, create um, a project that has a social impact, that has um, an environmental sustainability in mind and feasibility in mind. In implementing an innovation challenge um, in Sierra Leone and in Kenya and in South Africa, we realized that um, young learners in Sub-Saharan Africa doesn't really have many opportunities to, um, as part of their schooling, to problem solve or to think critically and to um, kind of enhance their creativity. And uh, when we realized that gap, we decided to start a school-based after-school program. And we run every day. Um, we're just piloting this in Kenya um, at a private all-girls school in the outskirts of Nairobi, uh, where we're um, teaching and facilitating design thinking process. Every academic term, we focus on a thematic challenge that is uh, pertinent in the country. So that can be anything from waste management, energy access, uh, safe drinking, uh, water access, uh, gender-based violence. In each academic term, students will work on a project um, that solves those um, pressing challenges in their countries um, to have uh, exposure and an opportunity to um, experiment um, solving kind of real life challenges. And um, just, I, I just wanted to also mention that about 10 years ago um, in a dorm room in Norway, there were four high school students who really wanted to, the, the organization itself what began with four high school students who really wanted to change the world and who really wanted to make an impact in the developing country. Um, by distributing malaria nests, by distributing one la like affordable computers. Um, fast track 10 years later, this is where we are. After constant iteration, they realize what is most needed in, um, in the developing world is to create an opportunity and platform for uh, young people and enable them to realize that they can uh, make a difference and uh, take civic actions to change their community. Um, fast track seven years later, one of the, one of the high school students um, that created Global Minimum uh, became Lemelson MIT student prize winner 
who is actually sitting right there in the back, um, also inspiring um, you know, a generation of young inventors. You saw Emma inspiring um, all of you today, and you can imagine that when you have somebody uh, like David Senge, or when you have somebody like Emma, who, you know, it doesn't, uh, there's no age limit to inspire um, the next generation of inventors, and they're the ones who are going to be, you know, leading um, and making a difference in this world. So it's really exciting to see many, you know, thousands of students go through our program and making really uh, true impact um, in this world. Yeah, and, and you know, me growing up, I grew up in an under-resourced community, and you know, even in my work, I was focusing in an under-resourced community. And often we see that there's, you know, the lack of lack options to opportunities like this, lack the supplies to actually do the projects. There's no such thing as prototyping labs. You're not going to find any of this. If you find a screwdriver, you know, you're pretty much lucky. So I know U.S. programs face that challenge, but developing country schools even face even more so. But you know, and in, in you just you know, you were expanding in Sierra Leone. There was a project. And you even faced it more extreme circumstances on top of the normal um, when the Ebola crisis hit in the program that you were trying to start. I mean, you, you were able to change, uh, turn a challenge into an opportunity. Can you tell us a little bit about, yeah. you know, tell us about that time during your program and how you really changed that to uh, impact lives, even though it could have been yeah, absolutely. missed opportunity. Thanks, David. Um, yes, as, as you mentioned, um, even in the U.S., uh, many of the schools are very much resource constrained. In Sierra Leone, you can imagine how resource constrained we are. And during the Ebola crisis, about two million uh, young learners were unable to go to school. They had to stay at home for about eight to nine months, um, not being able to receive education uh, during that period. And um, we uh, had the innovation challenge suspended. We had to suspend our innovation lab, which was part of the school because it turned into an Ebola treatment center. And what we decided to do at our organization was to develop a new program called Hack at Home Design Challenge Series. And it was a way for us to enable students while they're at home to still be able to hack uh, the pressing challenge that they were experiencing um, in the country. So we saw, we engaged about not, over 900 students across Sierra Leone who were um, communicating on kind of virtual communication platforms like WhatsApp and Facebook SMS. And we facilitated um, their, uh, their ideas into projects uh, during that period. Uh, some of the ideas that came out were, you know, students were creating personal protective gears in their homes. They were creating um, campaign sensitization campaigns, uh, creating, you know, A to Z of how to solve uh, Ebola. What what do you need to know about um, Ebola? Uh, we had students coming up with um, an innovative way of delivering food from one area to the quor quarantined area. Uh, so we saw a wide range of um, young people, which constitute about 60% uh, of, of, the, of the country is under the age of uh, 25, um, problem solving the, the dire crisis uh, in the country. And um, that was really inspiring to see that whole, yeah, that, you know, to, to know that young people can, they can solve their own problem. They don't have to rely on international interventions, that they can, and they are the ones going to, you know, make sure that when the next Ebola hits, that they can actually create the healthcare system, that they can have the education system that enables them to, um, to continuously see economic growth in their country. No, it's been a wonderful, inspirational story that always really really inspired me. And I know we're excited to have uh, Rose and Emma join us from Nairobi, Kenya, and flew over for this. You know, Rose, I want to talk to you, because often, you know, in US education, we've, we always hear about this focus on test scores. And I think there's a lot of folks who think that it's only a US issue. But internationally, there's this real focus on test scores, and that root memorization, you know, supersedes the uh, development of critical thinking and problem-solving skills. Um, can you tell a little bit about your school and some of the challenges that you and your students face in your community? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Coronado. I would like to give a very short story of the Merrike girls. This is a public school, 
Girls, Purely Girls Boarding School, located in Kiambu County, which is just next to Nairobi County. And it is a school that has a thousand girls and seven, a thousand and seven girls. And this is a school that also has 48 teachers and 36 workers, support staff. I want to say that it is in the category of the extra county schools. In our country, we have three categories of schools. We have the national schools, we have the extra county schools, we have the county schools, and we, we have also the district schools. So ours is an extra county school that is second, to, uh, second cate in category. And our school performs well uh, according to its category. And the school is actually 100 years old. It's one of the oldest schools in the country. It was started or founded by this lady called Mary Lique, who was the wife of a renowned missionary who was called Reverend Canon Harry Lique, uh, who is the father of the famous archaeologist who was called Louise Lique. So Mary is the one who started this school from a very, very humble beginning up to where it is today. And I think that's the brief history of the school, the brief story of the school. That's wonderful. Can you tell us, you know, how is this important to, you know, how is it invention education? Why is it important to you? Like I said, we talked about test scores and that being the focus of education. And, you know, not other ones, not everyone is willing to accept this type of education. How is this approach to education important to you and, you know, helping provide students these real critical thinking problem solving skills? Yes, I may go slightly back and, inform you that our, in our country, the education system that we have emphasizes on test scores more than anything else. There isn't much of emphasis on critical thinking as such. It is book reading and doing exams and getting test marks. And that is exactly what our school system is based on. Therefore, what happens is that in any institution in our country, there is a lot of emphasis on reading and passing the examination so that you may go to the next level of learning. In, in that kind of a situation, invention education is not emphasized. But as now, at, at, at this time, after involving or being involved in Innovate Kenya, which is one of the branches of Jimin. Uh, after we got involved in it three years ago, I can say that I have seen quite some change in our school, and mainly because Jimin is helping us very much in encouraging the girls to have a positive attitude towards the sciences. In our country, there is the tradition that sciences and mathematics uh, for men and boys, that uh, the girl child is a purely an artist child. Uh, so now what they, they do is, right from the beginning of the education system, you'll find girls shining away mathematics and sciences and not even performing very well. And this goes on up to high school. And with the Jimin involvement, we have seen that the girls are getting more and more encouraged to get to study the science subjects and even go on with the science courses in the university. Another thing I would say about Jimin is that uh, it is exposing our girls to invention education and the girls are now getting to think beyond or outside the box, whereby they do not just concentrate on what they are given, but they also go a step further and critically think and see issues that are a problem in the society, and they think about them and, and they see how, or they find out how they, these problems can be solved. All this because we, are, we have gotten involved with Jimin. And I would like to say, David, that 
our girls are feeling more and more encouraged to get deeper into the problems of the society and try to find solutions to the problems of the Kenyan people. I'm so excited that, you know, Emily, you have such an inspirational leader in your school who's there to kind of support and mentor and bring these types of programs in. You know, we got to see you as well talk about an issue that's very dear to your heart, and that's the electricity crisis within Nairobi. You know, did you ever think that you could solve these critical problems and really become the inventor that you are today? Mm, I'd say at first, uh, it was not clear. Uh, we just had this idea, but we didn't know how or is, is it gonna work? We like felt we have to quit, but uh, through Jimin, we, got, we went through the process, the whole design thinking process. We learned many things and they, I love Jimin because they were with us since from the start, from the small idea until we built up the prototype. So without Jimin, I think we could have killed the idea. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I had the opportunity to meet the rest of your team. They were, you know, you were supposed to come to the Eureka Fest uh, in Boston and do a little cross-cultural connection, but I know travel visas couldn't get you here. You know, they told me that a lot of girls don't feel like they could do this type of work, and, you know, you're doing this type of work. Why is this important for you? Well, I'd say, first, my mom always tells me I'm a hero. Yeah, I'm the one to change the world. Back in my country, like, our principal has said only boys or men uh, do science things and pursue engineering. But a girl child, it's high time we stepped up. They need someone to start them off so that they can come up. So I'm here representing the ladies back at my country and I'll pursue engineering and many, I know many of them will be encouraged and we're going to upgrade uh, we're going to be considered the same as men. What men can do, women can do, can do better, right? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah Josh, I, yeah, I wanted to turn to you, Josh, just because, I mean, I have seen, to follow that comment. <laughs> yeah, you have to follow that comment. I mean, it, it's amazing to see. This is just a small piece of the community that we have out there and a small piece of the success stories we have out here. I mean, the Lumos and MIT program has really kind of created a community around um, supporting students. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, what that community looks like? Sure. I um, it, it's definitely a, it takes a village sort of approach. I mean, the, the community is, is pretty vast, and I think probably the best way to think about it is, you know, what are sort of the basic needs of doing an invention project? Um, and I'll come back to this one, but the first real one is people. You need committed, passionate people. Okay, that's number one. Um, you need a space and tools. You know, that can be at a school, that can be at the local automotive shop. It could be the metal fab shop, but go there. It could be at iRobot, you know, a, a corporation. Uh, you need support and recognition. Uh, the educator and students need the support of the school. They need the support of the community. What does that mean? That means uh, civic groups need to know that these students and this educator or educators are working on something amazing that's impactful, uh, because if they know that, they can then direct resources or they can invite them to give presentations on their projects. It's amazing what you know sense of urgency can do for a project if you have an, a presentation imminent. Um, they can provide mentors. Um, uh, they can, you know, it, local companies, local organizations providing that support and recognition is critical. One of the things we do with invent teams is we make sure the local officials and state officials, elected officials know about that there's an, know that there's an invent team in your community. This is an important thing. You should recognize that. This is incredibly powerful for, I think, students and educators to see their school, their names, their project in a newspaper or being recognized by the senator or the mayor of New York City or the senator from Massachusetts or the governor of Texas. That's a big deal. And the president of the United States, of course. That's where recognition is great. Um, inspiration and aspiration. Um, companies need to invite educators and students on field trips. Uh, they need to, universities and colleges need to invite them uh, so they can see themselves as, as students. Um, you need award winners, you know, aspirational role models. Our prize winner, our Lemos MIT prize winner, our student prize winners, um, our invent teams, our JV invent teams, I mean, they're, they're all good aspirational role models for, for one another. But it really does come down to people. You need people 
who are passionate and committed to helping youth and engage with them. Yeah, and it really does take, you know, like a community village to really provide the support. It took someone to introduce that inventive thinking and creative thinking early on that just continues to power forward. You know, to looking at those in the community, this is a circle that's very close to invention. To think about the ways that you can engage in inspiring and educating youth, even if it's serving as a mentor. Because it really does take this community to continue growing so that we can serve more students, so that we can say that every student has, had an op has this particular opportunity. So it's not just for them, but it's for everyone. I want to thank our panelists, and please thank this amazing group of uh, individuals we have here today.